bless our time in your word. I pray that my words would be your words, not one word more or one word less. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this week, or last week, I signed up for kind of like a fun CrossFit competition in our gym, and what they do is they pair us up in groups of three, and then next Saturday, we'll actually be competing against each other. So they released the workout, and I got this kind of Facebook message thread from the other two people on the team talking about everything from strategy and what are we supposed to do, and then the most difficult question popped up. What's the team name going to be? It's like the hardest question to answer. It's a lot of pressure if you think about it. Because you want something that's going to be cool, but not cliche. You want something that's going to inspire confidence without arrogance. And ultimately, you need a name that's going to look good on a homemade t-shirt. A lot rides on this name. In fact, names are hard to pick, and that's just the name for a CrossFit team. A one-day competition. I've had to name things from a church, and the worst... Kids, you know how hard it is? Nobody prepares you for how hard it is to name a child. We spent months trying to figure out Brooke's name. That's where we found out we both like different names, different styles of names. We found out that there's certain names you can't pick because those are just too popular, even though when you finally pick that name, it becomes popular. So it doesn't matter anyways. You're sitting there rhyming the name against other things. You're thinking about how that name is going to impact that child in elementary school, middle school, high school, when they're getting a job. A lot of pressure. And in the midst of this pressure, my wife wakes me up one Monday morning and says, I'm glad we've picked a name. And I said, no, we haven't. (laughs) We've been debating this topic for months months trying to figure this out. See, my wife, she's a wise woman, and she knows that I have this habit of having conversations in my sleep, conversations that I will actually start. See, I'm the kind of person that when my head hits the pillow, I'm out, but apparently I'm still conscious enough to carry on a conversation. And in the midst of one of these conversations, my wife says, what about Brooks? And I said, oh, that's great. I probably started talking about how great it was. Even though I was sleeping the next morning, I'm like, I didn't pick Brooks. So we spent the next two weeks further debating, and finally I was like, I think I like it. I think it fits. It's it's hard to give a name, and we ask ourselves the question, well, why is it so hard to pick a name? Because it's like the first piece of someone's identity, isn't it? I mean, it begins to be the building blocks of who this person is going to become. And so we put a lot of weight on that name. And it's kind of funny to me because in our culture, we don't really think about a name's meaning as much as the meaning we give it. So oftentimes, we won't name somebody something not because of an origin of its meaning, but rather because we knew somebody with that name and they were an awful person. And we don't want our offspring to be awful, so we say, well, we can't name them that. But what's interesting to me is in other cultures, especially the biblical culture, Names could actually be the seat of your identity. They could actually encapsulate the very person you are. And that's really interesting when you come up to this next name in the book of Hebrews, Jacob. Because it's kind of a unique name, but if anybody's name embodies somebody's character to the T, it was Jacob's. See, Jacob, as we talked about last week, He was a twin, and he was the younger of the twins. So you had Esau, his older brother, by a few seconds, if even that. And then you had Jacob. Now, Jacob, uh, really, the origin of it comes from his birth story, which is this. It says, first came out the red child, Esau, whose body was like a hairy cloak. What a beautiful description, right, of a child? A hairy red cloak. So they named him Esau. And then it says afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding on to Esau's heel. And so they named him Jacob. Now, Jacob literally means heel grabber. (laughs) And you think to yourself, that doesn't really mean much at all, right? Heel grabber? Like, what's so intriguing about that? 
What's so intriguing about this kid named Heel Grabber for the first part of his life is what that name, the second meaning of that name, what it comes to mean. He cheats. You look at Jacob, and heel grabber doesn't mean much. It's kind of a funny story. In fact, when Esau and Jacob were kids, Esau probably used it to make fun of his little brother. It's like, hey, where's that heel grabber? (laughs) Hey, guys, look, it's heel grabber over here. He'll never be greater than somebody who just grabs onto my heel, right? You can almost see him starting to roll off the tongue. But later in life, heel grabber really starts to become more he cheats. The first time actually pops up right after the birth narrative in Genesis. And it says that Esau who we talked about last week was Isaac's favorite son because Esau was the manly hunter, the one that went out and could kill the big game and bring it back and cook up a good barbecue. Everybody likes the guy that can cook a good barbecue, right? That was Esau. And it says that one day Esau has come in probably because he was out hunting and he was starving and exhausted. And it says in verse 30 of Genesis 25, Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of the red stew for Jacob had been sitting there cooking his stew. He said, for I'm exhausted. And Jacob sees an opportunity. It's the opportunity younger brothers don't often get when the older sibling needs something from you. See, because generally, the way I've noticed it is this. The older sibling never needs anything from the younger. In fact, it's always the opposite, right? It's always the younger sibling that wants to hang out with the older. It's always the younger sibling that wants to be able to play with one of the toys that the older one has, but the older one says, no, I've even experienced it where the older sibling will actually look at toys the younger sibling owns, and he will lay claim, and then they are his, even on your birthday. (laughs) It's just the right of the older sibling, right? But then there's this rare moment, moments like this, moments where the older one actually needs something from the younger one. And it's in moments like that, that the younger sibling needs to seize the day because it's probably one of the few opportunities they're going to get. And in this instance, Jacob did just that. He looks at Esau, famished, and he looks at this little stew that he's been cooking up. And he says to Esau, sell me your birthright. Now Esau is the older sibling. He's entitled to everything, just about. In in fact, he's entitled to the very blessing that God has been passing down from Abraham to Isaac and now to Esau. And Jacob says, I want that. I want everything that comes with being the firstborn, even though I wasn't. And so Esau does what older siblings do. He says, I'm about to die. What use is my birthright to me? He says, sure, I'll do that. What Esau is thinking in his mind is, yeah, I'll tell him I'll do that, but I'll take it back later. Jacob knows what he's about to do. So Jacob looks at Esau and he says to him, swear it. (laughs) What's Jacob saying? He's saying, I know you're going to try and renege on this, so we're going to make this official. We're going to sign a little bit of a contract. So Esau, being so hungry, he actually does it. He sells his birthright for a bowl of stew and some bread. That's the first time that Jacob cheats Esau. And the second time, that hurts the most. That's the time we talked about last week when Isaac is getting old and he can't see very well. And so he tells Esau, hey Esau, go out, hunt, make me some food, and I will give you this big blessing that God has been promising you. And then Rebecca, Esau's mother and Jacob's mother, tells Jacob this, and she says, hey, you're going to get that blessing. And so Jacob not only cheats his brother, he lies to his father to do it. And then Jacob goes in, and in a crafty way that he cheats can do, he gets the birthright that's supposed to be Esau's. And he gets the blessing that's supposed to be Esau's. And when Esau comes in, and he sees the look of shock on his father's face, when his father realizes what has just happened, And he's given away everything he wanted to give to Esau, to Jacob. Esau looks, and he says in Genesis 27, he is not rightly named Jacob, for these two times he's cheated me. 
And then Esau makes a vow. When his father dies, when he's done mourning for his father, he's going to take care of this little problem he has with his little brother. And he's going to kill him. All of a sudden, Jacob's name, it catches up with him. All of a sudden, this identity that he's built, that he started to really grow into, becomes to bring about bad consequences. And now he's sitting here trapped, living in a family with an older brother that is weeks away from killing him, except for Rebecca, who overhears and tells Jacob, you have to run. Run far away. Run to my brother Laban and live in his land till your brother, as she says, cools off. And so Jacob does that. He flees because of his past. And he ends up living for an uncle who becomes his father-in-law who ends up cheating Jacob more than he's cheated anybody else. And so now Jacob is experiencing the other end of being cheated. So now Jacob has cheated his brother and now he's living in a life where he's trapped by his father-in-law with this name and this reputation and his father-in-law uses it to leverage against him and he cheats Jacob on several occasions. But in the midst of all this, God continues to bless Jacob. The problem is everybody looks at Jacob by his reputation and his name. So nobody believes this is the blessing of God. They just think Jacob is doing what Jacob does. He's cheating them out of everything they have. And so now the father-in-law is beginning to get angry. And the sons of the father-in-law are beginning to get jealous with Jacob. And now everybody hates Jacob. And Jacob is trapped in his past. Have you ever felt like that? Were you trapped in your past? Maybe you've made some decisions that you regret and all of a sudden you just can't seem to get past it. Maybe it's not decisions you've made. Maybe it's the way people perceive you and you can't seem to overcome the way people perceive you or maybe it's not the way people perceive you. Maybe it's just the way you are. Maybe you have built an identity that you look at now and you regret. That's where Jacob is at. And all of a sudden he finds himself in a place where he has no good option but to run again. And so where does he run? Where does any mama's boy run? He runs home. (laughs) Except he gets right to that border of home after fleeing from the father-in-law only to remember there's an older brother there waiting for him, ready to kill him. And so Jacob, who at this point has amassed a large family and a lot of wealth, says, well, maybe I can bribe him. (laughs) So he sends all kinds of gifts to this older brother that he's cheated and a messenger to say, hey, all this stuff is from your younger brother who loves you and will give you more if you don't kill him. And the messenger comes back to Jacob, and Jacob, of course, is in anticipation, waiting to hear what happens. And the messenger returned to Jacob, and he says this, we came to your brother Esau, and he's coming to meet you, and there are 400 men with him. Guys, what situation do you go into when you want to take 400 of your closest friends? When you want to take somebody out, right? Right? And here is Jacob, sitting here in what is now his darkest moment, trapped in who he has become. And it's in this moment, as he's just waiting for the inevitable, that it says this man comes into the camp at night, and he begins to wrestle with Jacob. And I love the picture of that. Because as scripture tells us, it's one of those moments where this man is God and this man, God, actually comes into the camp and he's wrestling with Jacob, literally wrestling with Jacob, but it's also this powerful picture for where Jacob's at. He's wrestling with his life and his past and a past that he can't seem to get around. And as he wrestles with God all night, it says that God is sitting there with Jacob and it says that, that God 
This point is not prevailing. Now, what does it mean? Does it mean that God's not strong and powerful and he couldn't take Jacob out in that moment? No. God is allowing Jacob to wrestle with him. God proves it by touching his hip and the hip all of a sudden goes out of socket. And Jacob will spend the rest of his life with a limp, but he continues to wrestle with God. And then God looks at Jacob and he says to Jacob, you have to let me go because day is breaking. And Jacob says this, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob is a man that is trapped in the life that he has built. And he's grasping on to his last opportunity, God. And he says, God, I won't let go. I won't let go unless you bless me unless you make the trajectory of my life different than it is now. And then God looks at him and he says something interesting. Kind of odd. He says, what's your name? Now in that moment you think about that. And if it's any other name, you just, you say your name. But for Jacob, his name is his identity. And his name's not just his identity, it's it's a picture of his very worst moments. So here is Jacob wrestling with God, and God says, what's your name? And what Jacob has to say back to him is a description of the worst parts of himself. Jacob, he cheats. And God looks at this man, Jacob, he's wrestling. The man everybody calls, he cheats. The man whose name is a perfect description of the worst parts about him. Can you imagine what that would be like if your name was a description of the very worst parts about you? And then God looks at you and he says, what's your name? What are those worst parts about you? Those parts that you're ashamed to even say. And Jacob says, my name is Jacob. And then God looks at him and he says, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. What I love about this story is in that moment, Jacob asks for a blessing. And God doesn't give him a blessing. He gives him the thing he needs most that he doesn't even think he can ask for. A new identity. A new life. What's so powerful about that name, Israel, he is striven with God, is the other definition of that name is God strives. And as you begin to look at this man that used to be Jacob, that has become Israel, what you realize is at each and every point of his story, you begin to see how in his best moments and in his worst moments, especially in his worst moments, God didn't give up on Jacob. God continued to strive for Jacob. All the way to the point where God says, Jacob, Let me give you a new identity. No longer be defined by your past, Jacob. Let me define you by your present. Jacob, I don't want you to be defined by your worst moments. I want you to be defined by God's greatest moments. Jacob no longer is going to be defined by what he has done. Jacob gets to be defined by what God has done for him. In that moment, God looks at him and he says, that's the blessing I've given you. Because Jacob came face to face with God and he wasn't destroyed. He was changed. What I love about that picture is there are some of us that really relate to that story. 
Some of you that may be sitting there and you know where Jacob's at. You feel like Jacob. Maybe you're right here and being right here in this place is your wrestling match with God. And God looks at you in that moment. And what is so beautiful about this place is in Christ, God says we can have the exact same experience Jacob had. We can have God look at everything we've done and no longer define us by what we've done, but by what He has done for us. In 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul said it like this. The Apostle Paul said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. In Christ, it doesn't matter if you walk into this place and you are Jacob. You are the aptly named person who everybody sees their worst moments. It doesn't matter if that's who you are when you walk into this place because God says, in Christ, you can be a new creation. You are given a new name. Your identity is no longer the worst things you've done, but the greatest things that God has done for you in Christ. You know, the powerful thing about getting to stand up here in this place and getting to do a baptism, whether it's when somebody is an infant or an adult, is the reality that God does for that person what he did for Jacob. To say, I will no longer look at you based on what you've done. I will no longer see you and see your worst moments. Rather, every time I see you, I will see your new identity in Christ. And when you are in Christ, you are in Israel. And it means that God strives for you. So whatever your past may have been, wherever you may have come from, whatever you may have done, know this. God doesn't want you to stay there. But an encounter with God can mean a brand new identity. Faith, Hebrews tells us, is a fresh start. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much that you would allow us to come to this place, God. And that you would give us this opportunity, Lord, to not be defined by what we have done, but to rather have our reality and our identity entirely changed to where we are defined by what you have done for us. God, I pray this morning, whether we are here in person or we are watching from afar, I pray that you would fill us with that reality, that our new identity is in you. We are yours in Christ. It's in your name, Lord Jesus. It's by your strength we pray. Amen.